Big Noon Kickoff presents Fair Bets. I'm your host, Chris Palika. Not beside me this week in New York. I am in the home office as you can probably tell uh, this week. I am Chris Palika. I'm with Jeff Schwartz. We'll be uh, joined by Will Hill, Sammy P, in the game and group chat shortly. Um, quite the weekend in uh, in college football. We got a couple of upsets there in the, the couple of Power Five championship games, beginning unfortunately uh, Friday night with your alma mater going down to Washington, and then we got the one that kind of upended the uh, the status quo and the hierarchy and what the college football playoff selection committee had been ranking in previous weeks with Alabama knocking off Georgia uh, in the SEC championship game, which resulted in the college football playoff committee of shooting out a top four of Michigan, Washington, Texas, and Alabama. Uh, we we have not had really an opportunity to discuss this personally. We've hit about it on text with, with Sammy and Will uh, as well. But you're, uh, I'm not going to ask you your thoughts on Friday night because we know you know your thoughts on that, and we don't want to re- re- rehash all, all that, but thoughts on ultimately what the uh, the committee, the, the, the committee conclusions that they came to in uh leaving Florida state out and putting Alabama in. I feel like you're punishing me bear for, for losing the Oregon game on Friday night, by not being here. Like I was hoping to, to be graced by your presence today and you lost all that money on, on the Oregon future. And you just, you, you can't be here today for me. I wanted to give you a bit. I wish I could have given you a big hug. I wish I could have given you a big Thank hug. You. I'm sorry. Look, here's the thing about Florida state guys. Um, the committee makes it up each year, right? They say, Best, and they've said this year that they want the best teams. And if that's the case, then you would have Georgia and possibly Ohio State in there. But they kind of sort of do this thing where they do best and most deserving, right? They kind of combine the both. And I'm okay with the idea that Alabama is better than Florida State. No arguments there. But you go 13 and 0 in a Power Five conference, you should be into the playoff. And the excuse, obviously, is that Jordan Travis is hurt their quarterback. And and my thoughts on this are, are a couple. Bear is is one. I think you're putting too much of a burden on a single football player for not playing, right? If, if if Florida State had said, and we saw his leg break in half, but if he had said, you know what, guys, he is back for the playoff bear. Florida State's a playoff team, right? If, if they said he was back for the you know high ankle sprain, he's back for the postseason, Florida State would be a playoff team. So you're putting, in my opinion, too much burden on a single football player not being able to play. And I understand that that single football player is the quarterback, the most important position in all of sports. I'm, I'm with you there, but to me, you're putting too much burden on this kid. He has to live with this forever. That it's his, his fault. He's the reason why an injury that he had nothing to do with, uh, you know, that, that rugby style tackle back of his leg broke his leg. And you're, so to me, you're, you're blaming one player too much for not being there. And secondly, it's a little bit disrespectful to, to think that Florida state with their coaching staff, who Mike Norvell has, has designed offenses at Memphis that have worked well now and at Florida State with the wide receivers they have, with the offensive line they have, with the defense they have, that they couldn't come up with a game plan in one month with a backup quarterback to play well in a bowl game. I was in this spot in 2007. We had a fifth-string quarterback bear playing a Sun Bowl in 07, and we put up 42 offensive points. Now, we're not playing Michigan's defense. It was South Florida. But the fact is, if you give someone, that was Chip Kelly at that point, a month to prepare for a team with a decent enough quarterback, not Jordan Travis, but someone who Florida State obviously felt good enough to be their backup quarterback, they could have moved the ball, in my opinion, on anyone they played. It's not going to be what they were with Jordan Travis, but you don't even give them that chance by not putting him in there. You're saying we don't even trust your coaching staff and, and your players on that team to put forth a competitive game against Michigan. It, 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 it's all about being competitive, right? And we think Alabama, and I I'm not, I don't disagree that Alabama's the better team and, and they, they would have put a more competitive game against Michigan. And in the end, the committee will be right because I think Alabama w- w- wins a championship there. So they're going to end up being like, well, see, we told you. We told you that they were the, the most deserving, the best team to be in there. And so, um, look, it's it's the four teams I think we all want to see. It's the four matchups in the end that make the most sense. Uh, and lastly, Bear, they didn't even put Florida State eight. They put him five. So they're telling them again, like, you're right there. You're so close. If your quarterback was healthy, you would be in, which we all know. But again, I think you're putting too much burden again on Jordan Travis of taking the blunt of you're the reason why they're not in the playoff. They should have put him eight, Ben. They should have put him eight at the very back of it and say, look, guys, you're not even good enough to be in the top five. You're now eight. Instead, they put him at five, Bear. They're just like a slap in the face. Yeah, that, that, that's the thing, like with, with the criteria and the way they order these teams, like in terms of saying we want the best four. So I guess once you get past that, maybe we're not caring about 
best anymore. And maybe we're just looking at the the criteria of the fact that Florida State did win a conference championship. Georgia didn't. Ohio State didn't. So we're going to rank them ahead of those two teams, even though we think that Florida State is not as good as those four teams. But yeah, as as I've said all week, like I, I think they did make uh, based on the criteria that they have that they, they did get them to the right conclusion. I think they they judge Florida State on the the couple of games that what they would be going into the playoff without their starting quarterback. And I know a ton of people disagree with that, and that, that's fine. That's why we we have conversations as long as, as, long as we're having. A, a civil conversation about this and like you're explaining your case and people throughout the week are explaining their case. Like, that's fine. Like just don't be that guy or person on Twitter or whoever else who's just MFing people up and down. And, and that that's where I just tune in. But if you, but if you like present me, Hey, well, why did they do this? And we have a conversation. Sure. Uh, yeah. But it, it's funny because people out there that have said like they succeeded in doing both things they succeeded in not only putting the four most deserving teams in, but not they also did not put the four best teams in. Like they succeeded in like doing like nothing of like what they said they're going to do. Because I think, but and it's hard to say, but Sammy's gone over with the power ratings as well. Like power ratings wise, the best four teams are going to be Georgia, Alabama, uh, Michigan. And 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 Texas, or maybe even Ohio State, but like like, like that's what we're going to get for the for the best four. So like, but the, you, you, there needs to be some sort of cutoff for the uh, for the as we say, there are five Power yeah. Five conferences, there are four spots. Someone was always going to get left out, and it just happened to be this last year of the four team setup where we had the uh, ugly ugliest possible option for uh, for the for the committee and. The kind of like the doomsday scenario. And it's my silly conference, the Pac-12, that has made it work out for all these years. We never had a team most years that was good enough to be in the playoffs. They always were able to put in the four other conferences. And now we had two, and obviously Oregon did not win that game. Now, it is officially bowl season bear, which means that uh, that, that God bless your bowl wagers because who knows who's playing, who knows who's coaching, who knows who's opting out, who knows who's transferring every day. There's more news. There's speculation about who's playing, who's not playing. But we're going to try to give you some wagers the next couple of weeks as we look at these rosters. We look at opt-outs, transfer portal, coaches, all those things that matter. Motivation is a huge part of bowl season. So we'll kind of walk you through the games that we like the next couple of weeks. Bear does like a couple now. We'll have a best bet as well at at the end of the show. Let's start out, Bear, in Charlotte, North Carolina, with the Duke's Mayo Bowl. And Bear promised me, guys, if he wins this wager, he will dump mayonnaise on himself afterwards. So we'll have a video for for you guys. If the the wager catches a Bear dumping Duke's mayonnaise all over himself. It's North Carolina, West Virginia. West Virginia is favored by three right now. North Carolina finished the season eight and four overall. Six and six against the spread. West Virginia also eight and four. And seven and five against the spread. Again, Duke's Mayo Bowl, Charlotte, North Carolina. What do you got here, Bear? I will absolutely do that on uh, the, the the as, as long as it's not going to affect my my, my uh, shoulder harness sutures because the game's going to be after I have my surgery. <laughs> so I want to make sure I'm okay with that. I want I want to just preface it, with, but yeah, absolutely. I, I will. I will. I want some 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 Duke's Mayo to dump on myself uh, if if the Mountaineers do get this job done uh, and beat North Carolina by more than three points. And, and you hit on it with motivation and playing these games is so difficult to do. This is more of an anticipation by me that I don't think Drake May and a lot of other North Carolina Tar Heels are going to play this game. Um, the second half of the year, UNC has not been good uh, at all. While the game's in Charlotte, I just can't see a whole lot of excitement for a team that was 6-0. and You were in the top 10, and again, for what they think the third straight year now kind of collapsed down the stretch. I, I, guess I, I think there'll be other opt-outs besides May. And West Virginia has been a surprise this year. I mean, last year we were talking about Neil Brown maybe being fired. Uh, they rattled off eight wins in a very uh, surprisingly successful year. An opportunity to go to the state of North Carolina, beat the Tar Heels, win nine games. I think that's a big deal for West Virginia after what they've been through in that program uh, the last couple of years. So I did lay the uh, the three with West Virginia, and hopefully you will too, because I think if nothing else, uh, you're going to get a good opportunity to, to maybe buy back if you wish to do so, because I think this number is going to run. 
I like it. Again, motivation, opt outs, those are things you you gotta follow. You know, the local beat writers, look them up, see what they're tweeting, see what they're writing about, kind of get the idea of what the coaches think might happen in this game. And maybe people leak out, of course, who's going to play and who's not. But I think it's very reasonable to think that the Drake Bay is not going to play in this game. And North Carolina's defense faltered down the stretch. Makes a lot of sense. Let's go to one more bowl game here before we get to gambling group chat. The Bad Boy Mowers Pinstripe Bowl. I believe this one is going to be Yankee Stadium as it is every year, Bear. Rutgers. Versus Miami. Miami's favored by two and a half. Total is low, 41 and a half here. Rutgers six and six from the season. Six, five, and one against the spread. The Hurricanes finished seven and five, but six and six against the spread. What do you got here in uh, the pinstripe bowl? Well, as, again, this one has just turned into guess the motivation along with opt out information portal. <laughs> it's been a while since Miami won a bowl game, but they don't have a quarterback. I mean, Tyler Van Dyke's in the portal, and they, they got backups who aren't really overly inspiring. They're going to have, have a, I think, eight other guys, I think, now who have left uh, in the portal. Like a winter's afternoon at New York at a baseball stadium, I don't think was exactly what Miami had in mind before the uh, the Georgia Tech game and after that upset of over, over a and I think Miami – is going to have difficulty moving the ball against the Rutgers defense, which did a pretty good job uh, against Ohio State and Michigan. So with someone, uh, maybe the only person in, in, in the country who has both a uh, a Rutgers helmet and a Miami helmet on his uh, on his bookshelf, the Miami helmet you can't see because it's directly behind me. Uh, uh, I actually did grab the three with Rutgers. It's two and a half pretty much in most spots now. I still take two and a half with Rutgers. You're going to mention it, I believe, later, the number you have about you know single-digit dogs um, in these mm-hmm. games. Like, if you like them to cover, they typically win the game. So uh, points are always important. You want the best number. But a lot of times in the bowl game, you're getting outright winning if you're taking an underdog who's less than a touchdown. That's, that's typically the, the way the games go. Um, yeah, I don't think those Miami boys are going to be happy about going to New York in mid-December for, for, for a bowl game. I don't think that, uh, that seems like something that uh, they're going to want uh, to do here. All right, let's get to the uh, the gambling group chat. Talk all things college football. We talk bowl games, our favorite wagers so far. Any awards that we like to maybe wager on this offseason, we'll do that next. It is me, the Bear, Sammy P. and Will Hill, gambling group chat. Here it is. Time again for the gambling group chat. Myself, Jeff, Sammy P, Will Hill. And we have, it, it. look, we're four or five days removed from selection day now with the whole Florida State, Alabama college football playoff decision to, to leave Florida State out and put Alabama in. Uh, we really haven't had a chance to voice our opinion. Well, I have, but everyone else here really hasn't. Uh, before we get into the ball match, which was, First thoughts, treetops. I, I mean, I guess, Sammy, any any thoughts on the on the playoff? Did they get it right? Did they not get it right? What what could have they done differently? I mean, I, I guess pe- people do still care about uh, hearing what we have to say because we really haven't had a chance as a group to kind of kick it around. I don't want to dance on Florida State's grave. That's not why we're here. But this is the best two games, I think, given the circumstances. Now, you can make a case Ohio State is better than Texas. Oregon is better than Texas. But look, when these teams lose at the end of their seasons, when Ohio State can't beat Michigan, Ohio State's out. When Oregon is a nine-point favorite, ten-point favorite against Washington and doesn't win, you're out. So, like, Texas did everything right down the stretch. Alabama clearly does everything right down the stretch. Alabama beats Georgia, the number one power rated team in the country in the SEC championship. Alabama's got to be in. But if you put Alabama in, guys, you got to put Texas in because Texas beat Alabama. And I know the Danny Canals of the world are going to cry all off season, but nobody wanted to watch Michigan and Florida State outside of Florida. We just watched Michigan play Iowa. We don't need to watch it again. Yeah, that that was my take. That was my takeaway watching those two games simultaneously. I'm like, Florida State is just like a flashier version of Iowa, the way that they're currently constructed right now. And it, look, it sucks. There's no way. There's no way around it. It does suck that that the Florida State we, we, the, for for those kids. But as, as I've said all week long, I, I agree. I think the committee did make the right decision. The biggest shock to me was that the committee actually did follow the criteria and protocol that they have in place to say best for and utilize the okay, 
player availability, coach availability, all these things to to get to that decision. So, Will, you, I, I, we kind of kicked this around. Like, you kind of laid this scenario out. Like, I, I think you did ask, like, the okay, what if Alabama wins? What happens? And I, I think you kind of went down this road last week, didn't you? Yeah, it's funny when you're in the prediction business like we are, you know, we can do these recordings and within 48 hours, we can look really dumb and it's happened before and it'll happen again. But not last week, we were kind of going through the scenarios and like, hey, if Bama wins, like they have to be in. And like Sammy said, you're putting Bama in, you got to put Texas in. So, you know, people always say, oh, Vegas knows, Vegas knows everything. You went to bed Saturday night around midnight on the East Coast. Florida State was minus 900 to make the playoffs, which made no sense to me. Uh, we kind of knew you had to put Bama in. And, and again, this is the first time you could say you had to put Florida State in because they won all the games. This is the first time the committee kind of got caught with their pants down where the first nine years or so, look, we, reasonable minds can differ. But for the most part, they didn't have any oh no scenarios where they just had to completely screw somebody. They sort of danced through the raindrops. There was no dancing through the raindrops this year. They had to really stick to somebody. We did get the four best teams or the four most deserving. It doesn't sit completely right with me. I'm conflicted because like I, I, it doesn't sit totally right with me that these kids won all their games and they get left out. Like there is part of me that, you know what, that's not really fair. And two things come to mind. What if Travis didn't get hurt. Who would be in that? That is really fascinating to discuss. Yes. Who got, who would have gotten Florida left State, out? Florida State would absolutely be in if Travis. Right. Was in. And, they're and undefeated he, with Travis. They're absolutely in. And then the question is, do they put Texas or Alabama in? And I think that ultimately decision would be that they would have put Texas in because they did beat the head to head. And then everybody, and then you would have had the SEC champion out. It would have been a that would have been brutal to leave a, a one loss SEC champ out after beating Georgia. So who knows? We'll never know, I guess. Um, it, it's just tough. Here's the other thing that really bothers me that not the issue I have, what if Florida state had a five-star recruit as a backup quarterback, would they be in then? Like, I don't want to get in the, I don't think it's fair. And look, we're going to go to 12 teams. So these, um, debates are going to be quiet a little bit, but I, I don't think we should be in a position. Now we're going to like recruiting rankings for who gets in and just making those sort of, you know, sort of subjective decisions, but we're going to get two really good games. It should be a lot of fun. Um, you know, look, looking forward to these games that the lines are low. So uh, it's why we talk about the college football pl playoff rankings all year. And I always say the same thing. I'm like, look, let me know at the end. The only rankings I care about are the final ones because th this committee, they can make the rules. They can break the rules. They can hop teams around and use basically whatever criteria they want. They're vague. They're vague for a reason. So we saw that play out here. Yeah. And, and I think the fact that we saw and now that you mentioned alluded to the lines, like you got two, two spreads, uh, four points or fewer. Only 2017 is the last time, the only time. You've had spreads in the semifinal this short. So uh, in terms of competitive games, I think we got them. Uh, does, like does, does it does the it feel for the Florida State players? Sure. But the committee had to make a decision. Like at some point with five power conferences and only four spots, there was going to be a situation like this. So, but but the 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 two games, I, I think for the and for the first time, I think in the playoff era. You could make an argument that any of the four teams could win, couldn't you, Jeff? Oh, I certainly think so. I mean, look at the matchups, right? I mean, you you have a, a Washington offense that went on is nearly unstoppable, and Texas's pass defense at times can be suspect. They haven't played a team like this. I mean, Oklahoma, I guess, was the closest passing attack, and Texas, excuse me, and in Washington's better than that. There's some matchups I think that, that favor Texas on offense as well. And you look at Alabama, Michigan. I mean, is anyone ruling out Alabama right now? I would say no. And Michigan's offensive line not as good this season. Some injuries on the offensive line as well, and they've proven in January to not live up to the moment the last six years on, on, on under Harbaugh. So I think anyone can can win this one. Obviously, Washington, uh, their their shots. Uh, they're they're uh, they're odds are the longest, and look, they continue to sort of go against the wisdom of Vegas and power rankings and and sort of where teams are at efficiency numbers because they are near the bottom of of all these four teams by a wide margin, right, Sammy? I think Washington still I saw eleven in power rankings, somewhere around the eleven in efficiency rankings, and they can very easily beat Texas and then go ahead and beat Alabama or Michigan. I've got Washington ninth in the country. But again, these are just power ratings to get us to a number that the books have to massage. Power ratings are not the end-all, be-all. Power ratings basically give us an idea of where these teams are without bias, right? We can have numbers that come out that Team A should be favored by Team B by 30 points, but people aren't going to want to lay 30 points. So you make it 26 or you make it 27. The odds makers make the numbers and then the bookmakers sort of shape the numbers based on how the action will likely come in. You can't make Washington a seven point dog against Texas. My numbers have 125 
and 120, which is basically right on the nose. That's five. The spread is four. Um, and obviously five is sort of a dead number in, in college football. But, you know, the odds process, you make the number, the computer spits out the number, and then you have to, as we know, guys, you have to massage the number to where you believe it will basically get good two-way balance, not tickets, but handle. I mean, that's the objective, what we do here. Um, I, I look at these totals too, Will. I mean, a 20-point gap between Alabama, Michigan at 45, <laughs> and then Texas, Washington at 64. The books are basically telling you one of these games is going to be a defensive slugfest. The other one will have fireworks. Yeah, and I'm curious what your numbers say about Bama, Michigan. I kind of feel like Bama's going to close the favor here. They've already gotten bet. I think that there, there was like a rogue three out there, Michigan favored by three, and that's come trickling down to basically, I, I don't know, I didn't look at it this morning, but last I saw Michigan was minus one. I think that's a tough matchup for Michigan, and the look on Michigan, uh, their faces, those kids' faces, I think said a lot, where it's like, oh, man, we were kind of hoping for Florida State because Michigan likes to bully people. They like to strong-arm people. They, they win with physicality. You can't really out-physical Bama. That's a tough one. You get Saban with a month to prepare. Pair. And who knows? I mean, there's whispers. This is Harbaugh's last game at Michigan facing the allegations. Who knows if, you know, Saban's not a, a young guy anymore. I don't think he would win a championship and ride off into the sunset, but you never know. So um, it, it, that's a, it's such a good matchup. I, I do like Bama. I think, you know, what got lost last weekend in all the who's going to get in, who's going to be out. I think Michigan's longest play from scrimmage last week against Iowa was like 15 or 16 yards. They basically did nothing on offense. If you bet Iowa, boy, that was a tough one because you're, you know, you're getting a whole ton of points three North of three touchdowns. You basically give up no offense and you still don't cover the number. That's a tough one. So I think it's a good matchup here for Bama. Hey, can we tip our cap to you bear? You said on the show, you said on Fox last week, Iowa is going to score zero, <laughs> zero. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and, and and zero ultimately uh, with one and it was I mean yeah the, with the one play I guess we had the the, the turnover there that got him out of out of field but but it was it, it was just awful to watch and, and just you knew the way the game was going to go and it was a dead under and it was weird because I, I think I remember we were talking about potential numbers I think in that game and, and I, someone said like I think the game's twenty six or so. And I, I at the open, I bet well, Michigan minus 21 and a half. And ultimately, the, the, the game did land right on 26. So uh, whoever said that, kudos to them. It was funny. I was thinking about when you when you mentioned the, the Michigan team looking at the uh, the uh, the Al the uh, Al Alabama announcement that it was going to be there. But it brought me back to 2017 when you had Clemson was number one. And Alabama was in the mix to beat number four. And Ohio State it was a two-loss Big Ten champ. And I, and I can remember, like, the, the, oh, you got to put Ohio State. Some like the people associated with Clemson were like, oh, yeah, you got to put Ohio State in. They, they won their league, right? And, and then, of course, they didn't. And Alabama, as the fourth seed, uh, just smothered Clemson that night uh, in the Sugar Bowl. So it kind of reminds me a little bit of that where you got an Alabama team in at four that, clearly is much better than that. Um, so, yeah, it, it's going to be interesting. But I do agree with Will. I do think that that Alabama will close uh, as the favorite in, in this game. And, and you just you, you watch the way they control the, the line of scrimmage again, against uh, Georgia in the SEC championship game. I mean, you would think that they probably would be able to do uh, the same thing here. So uh, first – First, first impression is I, I do think Alabama will win that game. The, the set, the second game, and Jeff hit on it a little bit as well. Like the Texas secondary has allowed some, some yards at some point, but I would just want to know at some point, like, is this defensive front at Texas going to be able to kind of really get a push up front and disrupt Penix and disrupt that timing and kind of throw their passing game off Jeff. Cause I don't, I, look, Oregon's got a good defensive front, but they haven't faced anything like, like sweating the guys that they're going to be facing right. up front here. You're absolutely right. And, and the weaker part of Washington's offensive line is up the middle. So it, it is a, a, a favorable strength for them in this game. Um, but I think, look, early on, I, I think like a first half over in this game when you give the, the coaches a month to prepare in, in Grubb and DeBoer and Steve Sarkeesian until like sort of defense sort of figure out what's happening in front of them. I just don't think that it matters early in the game. I think later in the game, a Texas defensive line can surely take over. If they're able to stop Dylan Johnson and keep Michael Penix, you know, kind of a little happy feeling there. Guys, look, 
Washington had three games this year on offense where they had 306 yards or less. So they've, they've had had games this season where it hasn't looked pretty. Arizona State, zero offensive touchdowns. Uh, Oregon State, Washington State down the stretch against Oregon. Obviously, they looked incredible. So maybe Texas pressures them up front to, to, to get Penix out of the room. But I, guys, Sark, with a month to prepare against Washington's defense and with DeBoer and Grubb a month to prepare against Washington, I think early on there's a lot of points scored. It comes down to who makes the better adjustments in the second half. And that's sort of how I see this game going. Guys, are you surprised Washington is plus 750, plus 800 to win a championship? I They've won, what, 22 straight games in a row? They seem to win all these close games. I, I was surprised to see this number so long because it's just two wins. You, you beat a Texas team, you're a short dog, you go play Alabama or, or Michigan. I, I feel like that number is pretty long for them. Yeah, you might be onto something there. I just think, I'm curious what you guys think in terms of uh, the location of this game, how much does that matter? Barry, you're traveling to these, these spots a lot and you know, the, uh, you know, the logistics of it, this game is in Louisiana, it's in new Orleans. So Texas is a lot closer to new Orleans and Washington. Are we going to turn this game on? And if you bet Washington, you're like, Oh no, this is like 80% longhorn fans. Is that how it works? Or is the ticket allotment sort of fair in terms of that? Well, well, both, both. Go, Jeff, go ahead. I was, I would say, look, I, 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 we talked to some people in Seattle, like the flights to get from Seattle to new Orleans are $1,500, $2,000. Like, I don't know if people are going to be able to get there, even though the, the, the ticket allotments as bears, but I say are even right. Like they get the same amount of tickets. It's just a matter of Watch. can they get there? And then also the secondary market of just driving from Austin, Texas to new Orleans and buying tickets, you know, like in, in that manner um, and all those ticket apps. So people like I, Washington's radio guy was telling me he might have to just drive from Seattle because like they like not, not the play by play guy, but a, a, a local radio guy, like he might have to drive from Seattle because it's so expensive to get down to New Orleans. So, but again, like Washington's offense is built to play in this situation. They're a shotgun offense. They're a passing offense. It's inside on the turf. Like to me, this is a great situation for their team to back against the wall sort of thing. Again, guys, no one believes in us. It's a Texas home game. We're the underdog. I mean, all the things we've seen from them all season. So bear, I don't think it matters very much to me. Of course, they would have loved to play in the Rose bowl. It's closer. It's a traditional Rose bowl game for them, but I don't think location to me matters as much as maybe other programs, other sort of offense or defenses. You know, and, and I think you can get creative if you're looking to go down there, if you're a Washington fan, I saw some people joking that, hey, well, we'll just, we'll just fly to Houston, drive from Houston to New Orleans, win that game, and then just stay in Houston all week. But knowing knowing, <laughs> knowing this is ridiculous for me to even say, but like knowing this is having, having booked a lot of travel in and out of New Orleans and in and out of Baton Rouge, right? that is a very expensive place to fly in. There aren't a t as many flights in and out of there as there used to be post Post Katrina, and I can remember getting in and out of there after the national title game, like in having to do my expense reports and see the price of that ticket compared to what the price of the other tickets have been. Like it, it's mind blowing, but, but I, I think if you if you can find a spot to fly into somewhere in the air, maybe you fly into Pensacola or, or, or Mobile. I mean, I think there are places in the area that you could probably, if you're creative enough, uh, be able to afford to get there. But that being said, I do think it will be a massive. A home field edge for Texas, and, and I think the way that Alamo Bowl went last year with uh, Worthy didn't have a great ga a great game, uh, Ewers didn't have a great game, uh, Washington got it going down to San Antonio and beating up uh, on Texas in that game as an underdog. Like I, I think Texas really they 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 are relishing the opportunity to be able to get another shot at Washington after that game uh, a year ago, and obviously this one with 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 so much more on on at, at stake here. Uh, we were talking about the future price, Jeff. You brought it up. You say seven or seven fifty on Washington. Yeah. What? Yeah. What? What is it now? That's what I saw yesterday. Is it change at all? Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be seven fifty. But seen, technically, you could get a better shake if you were to just money line Washington in the first game at like plus one seventy, and then you roll that over in the championship game. They're going to be a three to one dog. So let's say you bet a hundred, you win two seventy or collect two seventy then roll that, you know, you could technically, and if you get a higher price, let's say Alabama pummels Michigan, you probably get a better number if you roll it over um, on the money line. I mean, we're talking peanuts here. We're not talking hundreds of dollars. We're talking about a small scrape, but 
you you probably get more money if you bet Washington money line in the first game and then just roll that over into the title game where they're going to be an eight point dog whoever they play if not more. How in in, in the in the bowl season? I know the, these two games are kind of immune to, and we're going to have a couple of weeks here, I think, to really dive into into both of these, but. Bowl handicapping now is so difficult because of the portal, because of NIL, because of the coaches having to leave because of the recruiting schedule. Like I, I went down and, and looked and like, and like there were only three games that I felt like I could even like put on this podcast that, that I felt good in, in giving a number because I'm kind of anticipating the number maybe running the other way. So at least I'm going to get a good number now. Uh, the, the the total on the side in the uh, in the Sun Bowl have got I mean, uh, Notre Dame's been it's been bet down to like eight eight and a half that totals run down uh, the news about Missouri uh, or news about Ohio State rather and their and their opt outs like, like that is what caused that number to to run down and I guess the reports that Trevian Henderson might be coming back down so but it, it's just it's I mean I, I do you guys have a, have a process or a way or what are you looking for now in handicapping this game because it used to just kind of be like motivation and maybe a guy or two would would sit out like like Sammy how how do you like account for all this in, in your either just can you adjust your number enough is there a way you can actually do it and feel good about the number that you're looking for and and how you actually going to bet these games at least uh, uh, pre kick Here's my process this year. It's unlike any other year in bowl season. I just close my eyes and throw a dart because with, with NIL, I mean, I don't mean to be facetious here, but you know, you can have this, this Missouri Ohio state game. That's going to be pretty one-sided in terms of opt-outs. And then, you know, guys wanting to play on the other side, we know that Ohio state's going to be without obviously McCord Harrison jr. I imagine Stover's not going to play. We'll see on Henderson. I mean, Meanwhile, everybody at Missouri, is going to want to play because everybody at Missouri wants to win this game. However, you take a game, for example, like Penn State and Ole Miss, you're basically handicapping which schools care. We already saw Chop Robinson opt out for the draft. Mm -hmm. Who knows with the NIL, though? What happens when somebody comes along and says, yeah, you know, we're going to we're going to come in Ole Miss and we're going to take wide receiver two or we're going to go into Penn State and we're going to take DN number three. I, I just I don't know that it's been more difficult to fire early in bowl season because we've had to deal with opt-outs for a long time. Guys go into the NFL draft and you can basically kind of pinpoint 20 or 30 guys at the top of the board that are likely all going to go if they're not in big bowl games. But now with the transfer portal and the NIL taking boundary steps to new levels and all this stuff about guys can get paid now, it changes everything. And I have basically two bets right now. I have Missouri plus three, and I've got the uh, the over in the Arizona-Oklahoma Bowl, the Will Hill special, the Arizona squad <laughs> against Oklahoma. Even without Dylan Gabriel, those teams are probably going to get up and down the field. But I've only made two bets. These lines have been out for four or five days now. This is as little I've had in the kitty in the first few days since the openers. It's, it's just so tough to navigate right now because – Things are going to keep coming out until kickoff on both teams and in more ways than ever. Yeah, I got, I got one more than you. I got three. I got a I got a Rutgers plus three. I got an, a, 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 a Sun Bowl under 46 and a half, Nebraska, Oklahoma State. And I got an Ole Miss plus four and a half. Cause that, that's the one game that I feel pretty good about. Um, the way Lane, the way Ole Miss kind of got run out in their bowl last year by Texas Tech. Uh, you mentioned Chop Robinson. I think they're going to be other guys who opt out for Penn State. Manny Diaz is very strongly linked to uh, to the Duke job now. So th th this could be this. This is one of those games that I think this number by kickoff could run up to like six or so. So uh, I feel good about getting on the right side of that number. Will, you got anything in pocket right now or anything that you're you're looking at or, or, or do you kind of feel the same way that Sammy and I do about just the overall difficulty of, of handicapping these games early on? 
you know, there's that saying, hey, we don't we don't bet teams, we bet numbers. Well, this this case, you're not betting teams, you're betting news. And I think there's two ways to approach it. Try to anticipate the move and get ahead of it and just, you know, be, beat the books of the punch, which is very hard to do either. You know, you see the move come out. Hey, a quarterback sitting out and you go to bet it. You're only going to have like a minute, 30 seconds. The lines move so quickly now um, that that's a hard approach, especially now, like most of the news has come out. The other approach is just, hey, wait for the dust to settle. These guys can opt out and then opt back in if they don't transfer. Like, so you either go really early or I think you go really late. Um, I, I don't think you do badly in the, in the ball. If you just let's just, you know, to, to use round numbers, if you threw 10 bucks on every underdog on the money line, you probably do okay with all this uncertainty. Right. You're probably going to see some upsets, just high variance. So you want some action on these games. And, you know, that's what's great about bowl season. These games are on during the day, afternoon, weekdays. People want to throw a few bucks on it. Uh, you, you can't really go wrong. I don't think, I think you'll do okay. Taking the underdogs on the money line. One that jumps out to me, Northwestern plus seven. This was a team lined at three and a half. The under, got pounded i think this is going to mean the world to them to possibly uh win a bowl game uh utah who knows with their quarterback situation that seven looks like a lot so uh one that's still available northwestern plus seven looks good to me pac 12 expert jeff schwartz what do you think yeah well so so here's here's another wrinkle to all of this right so there are players who have declared for the portal that are still playing their bowl games so, for example, Utah, Bryson Barnes has opted out, and I believe he's playing in the bowl game. So, like, I, I, sure, I guess I was listening to something else. Like, the four players opted out somewhere else, and they're still playing the bowl game. O okay, I mean, not everyone's doing that. Not everyone's doing that. Are they actually going to play in those games? And then another thing to consider, too, is when coaching staffs leave, the new coaches don't coach in the bowl game. So, you're left – on some some situations with the coaching staff that's like half a coaching staff so ga's are coaching analysts are coaching young guys are coaching are they more motivated to, to prepare for a bowl game are they even in a position to coach well in a bowl game um you know there are there are schools where quarterbacks have said they're going to play for example bo nix in oregon said i'm going to play but for how long <laughs> is, he gonna, is he playing the whole game against liberty yeah. sam hartman i think they're, he's going to play but like how long is he going to play for? And so all these things I, I think are tough. And there's also a trend, guys, by the way, of the losing team in 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 a conference championship. The Pac-12 team is 0 for 11 in their bowl game. The, the loser of the Pac-12 championship game. The SEC loser we've seen for so many years now has lost the bowl game. Now, of course, this is a little different with Georgia, Florida State. So some some of these trends, I think, will hold true. There's a motivation factor. We talked about it with, uh, I, I know Will likes Arizona on the money line, like when it first came out. I mean, Arizona's going for 10 wins right now. So there's certain situations, I think it's very sparingly to bet these these, these spots. There's just so much unknown. Live wagering is a way to go or, or just wait to game day and hope yes. it works out. I, I think you made a great point about coaches leaving and just shattering programs. The perfect example last year, one of the biggest bets we made, and again, Hindsight is 2020. I'm not trying to just brag about a win. But last year, when Purdue went to the Big Ten Championship and they got basically creamed by Michigan in a defensive battle, if you will, Jeff Brown was going to Louisville. And he took the entire offensive coaching staff with him, not to mention Aiden O'Connell opted out to go to the NFL draft. So Purdue was on interim coach, interim offensive coordinator, quarterback three, wide receiver eight. Purdue Bear lost 63-7 to LSU last year. And I believe the cheese at Bowl. You couldn't write a number big enough on LSU because Purdue literally had nothing to play for. The balloon had popped and the coaches all left. There was nothing to play for. We would have laid 40 and would have won. 63 to 7, final score. That that's what I was going to say. Um when we talk about like getting ahead of the news, like a lot of times, like you, you get during the regular season, like the number goes from one to, to three and a half. It's like, I can't lay north of a field goal. I didn't get the best of the number. I, I just got to remain hard, steadfast and not better. Like in these bowl games, like you can't make the number big enough. You just can't do it. Like what did, what did we lay with LSU early on? Like six or something like that? And then it wound up closing at like 18, I think it was. Like the, the number couldn't be high enough. Oregon State, Florida, I think was another game last year where yeah, I love that you, knew, yes, you, knew Florida was, you knew Florida wasn't going to be there. There, there was a... um. An Remember Oklahoma, the Cotton Bowl, Bear? This is like three years ago. It was Oklahoma, Oklahoma Florida, yep. and Florida. Yep. Florida loses the SEC championship. And then Kyle Trask opts out. Pitts opts out, their top two wide receivers opt out, and then Oklahoma's like, yeah, we're going to play everybody. And Florida got, that line went from three to seven to nine, and 
you know, it, it got hairy at the end, but Oklahoma ran that game running away. And, and then what Will was saying, too, about the, the dogs and betting out, and I was kind of nodding my head, like, I have to update this. I did not include a 2022 in this yet. But if you look at the single-digit dogs in, in bowl games, I have it back uh, the last, uh, since 2008 is as far back as, as I went with the data that I got. So it's what, excuse me, that would be what, the, the 14 years? If you look at single-digit underdogs, 40% of them cover. But among the ones that cover, 77% went outright. So that's kind of getting what to what Will's saying. Like if you could just play them, play them on the on the on the money line to win because you're much better off getting that bang for your buck on an underdog that you think is going to cover. Because odds are if they're going to cover, they're probably just going to win the game outright. Good line betting opportunities, I think, in bowls too, because you see a lot of momentum. You see a lot of big swings where a team's down and they come back. So that, that's a good thing to keep an eye on too in terms of live betting. And anything else that I mean, again we're, we're we got plenty of time before we kick around uh, any of these other games. But is, is there anything else that you guys care to uh, get ahead on? I mean, I, I think there really isn't a bet to be made uh, in the Heisman at this point, unless you think that the voting is going to come back for uh, for for Michael Penix at, at the prices. It looks like Jaden Daniels is going to be the guy. You got any thoughts on uh, Army Navy? First quarter under. <laughs> it's, it was funny. I went. I went back and looked because the totals what twenty seven. You, you look like, last year. There were last yeah. year thirty, fifteen, thirty eight, twenty seven, twenty seven, thirty eight, thirty eight, twenty seven. So it's been right around there uh, the 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 last ten years or so. So yeah, it doesn't feel like a like like a bet for me anything there. But uh, here's an interesting prop, and it gets into the game uh, that's tonight. What do you mean? More points scored, Army, Navy, or Panthers or uh, Patriots, Steelers? Oh boy, I'll I'll oh, say geez. Army, Navy. Yeah, uh, I'll say Ar Army, Navy. Army, Navy. Army, Navy. I mean, I'm does a, does New England score tonight again, Sammy? Do they score at all tonight? I would say no, right? There's no chance. I mean, there's a well, chance. Bailey Zappi, like a, like a, like a Zappi's Mr. back Mr. under center. Like, Zappi's the future in New England, if you didn't yeah, know exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah, he was great last week. He was terrific. The next couple of weeks. Like, yeah, uh, they didn't like even a, get inside the like red a zone. Mitch Trubisky? Last week. Uh, Mitch, Mitch I don't Trubisky know. pick six. I mean, my, that might be the only way they score, right? The problem with Army Navy is, and I've done this in my life, we've all been there, I think. Well, maybe not all of us, but we've <laughs> looked at Army Navy in 2014 or 2015 and gone, you know, 32 is not a lot of points. And then you flip it on in the third quarter and it's six to two. And you're like, I'm not getting the 30, <laughs> let alone 20. So, and those Eat teams, the problem is half. those teams don't have any talent. Like there's no home run plays in an army Navy game. You might get a home run play in an NFL game. You're just sitting there just dying through a, a 14 play 11 minute drive. It's going to end in a field goal. And it's just like, oh, why did I put myself through? It's kind of like, and then I'm it starts snowing. Out. Remember, like army, and then oh, it's oh, here comes the snow, yep. and you're like, oh that my was the god, mental never gonna get I, 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 Yep, I, I've been there for that. That <laughs> it's an all, it's look, it's a bucket list type game and a bucket list type atmosphere, but it's not necessarily one that, if it were not a standalone game, would you really want to be betting on this game? Probably not. But it's funny, I was sitting here thinking about this, and I it was saying to you guys before the, before the show, like. But betting the uh, the over in Army Navy is kind of like what I'm going to put myself through tonight and just be a total contrarian and bet under 257 in uh, in Bucks Pacers just just because I haven't made an NBA bet all year. I don't think I've made an NBA bet since last year when some futures and stuff. But uh, I'm, I'm going to bet under 257 in the Bucks Pacers and I'm going to be that guy. I'm going to be the anti fun guy. Well. That I would love a bear cam to just watch you watch the game as they're going up and down. And you going to watch Duncan. <laughs> okay, so you're just going to check the final score. That's probably the best way to play is just check the final score at the end as it's you know 138 to 134 or something. So I'll be rooting for you. Maybe I'll tell you what. What are we getting under 257? 257. Maybe there's a little more intensity because they're playing for something. I, don't, I mean, I don't know what this in-season tournament means to these guys, but uh, maybe, no. maybe I'll tail along with you. I think I'm going to take the Pats plus the six, though. I mean, six is a lot in a game that's lined at 30. I mean, Pittsburgh's no great team either. They don't win by margin. So Trubisky doesn't have that much time to get reps with the ones. I don't know. I could see a 17-13, 13-10 type of game. So I'll take the six, and I'm going to watch it. So uh, as soon as I fall down 7 nothing, I'm probably dead. But that's a lot of <laughs> points, isn't it? 
Oh, I, I know, I know it'll be on. I know it'll be on in my house. That's for sure. I mean, I mean, if the game ended nine nothing, Steelers win. Would that surprise you at all? No, no, like no, it, no, no. Like it would, it would. I mean, look, what's the number, Sammy? That it's the first time since 1938 a team has has given up ten points or less in three straight games and lost. You know how hard that is to do. Uh, it, like it, it. I, I, I would not be surprised if this game legit. No one scored a touchdown this game. It was nine to nothing. Steelers win this game. It would not surprise you. You can bet that. You can bet yeah. no touchdown at twenty to one. I wouldn't go there, but if you are feeling froggy, you might as well leap. This is also, boys and girls, the lowest total since nineteen ninety three of the NFL when wow. Mrs. Doubtfire was number one at the box office and Mariah oh, yeah. Carey was number one on the top forty. So that's where we're at in the year of our Lord, 2023. But conversely speaking, because everybody is shorting offense, you can get better numbers on any time touchdown guys. The one guy that I want to circle here, and again, this is a small bet. This is a little to win a lot because it's a six, seven to one shot. If there's one Patriot left, if there's one guy left on the battlefield, it's Hunter Henry at six to one. If the Patriots score a touchdown, I like his chances, and usually, Bear, this guy is priced like 250, 320, 6 to 1 on Hunter Henry because nobody thinks anybody's going to score. So those numbers tend to go up. That's a, that's a great point because, I mean, you, you do get a lot of good contrarian type. Okay, I'm going to go the other way and look for the value that I normally wouldn't get on some other players. I guess before we end – the, the 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 chat here like FCS quarterfinals, uh, any but any 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 interest there in any any futures? But I I, I did I see that the the Jack Rabbits now are like minus two eighty or so to uh to win. So uh, kind of hard to stomach laying that. I do think they will win if if you're looking to uh to kind of play that out and, and and lay that. But any of these four games, were there any sides or totals that anybody saw anything? Not for me. We made it through the podcast without talking about our Oregon futures, which died a painful death on Friday night. So we could just end the podcast as far as I'm concerned. That it hurts so Thanks, much. Will. I, I appreciate, I appreciate that. Hey, Guys, we're all I in it together. To, I, know, I had to, I know. So I had, I did post game radio, right? Like after the Oregon Washington game, I put on my headset to start my radio show. Cause we were doing like immediately afterwards. I had to listen to Washington's radio guy, Tony Castricone call the final play of the game and just him scream and yell about how good Washington is, how they beat Oregon again for the third straight time, how they're 13-0, how they're going to the, the playoff. And just and then I was like, all right, talk about the game, Schwartz. Have fun with that for an hour and a half. It was it was worse for me, guys, I promise you. Yeah, yeah. To, to lose the equity in, in, in those futures. And, and I had conference championship parlays with Oregon and then Alabama and Georgia and Florida State would have had to win. So like I could have been in a really, really, really good position entering that ACC title game if I just wanted to lock a profit in. But yeah, lo losing out on well into well into five-figure profit because of the Oregon loss was, it, it sucked. But uh, I did enjoy a nice dinner at St. Elmo's. I did not snort uh, horseradish sauce like Mark Ingram did on Saturday night. I I, I was well-behaved, did not drop on me. Uh, good meal as always. So I'll do it for now, I guess. We'll uh, we'll be back next week. We'll be able to dive into a lot more of these games. Uh, appreciate your time, as always. Good luck this weekend with uh, Chase and Army Navy or, or, or whatever else we're going to have to bet on this week. All right, back from the Gamma Goop chat. I'm disappointed we did not get any, any FCS action in this one, Bear. I, I was like ending the uh, the group chat with a little a little money to put somewhere on, on some of those, uh, the, the was 16 team playoff, like an official playoff, a bracket. Those games are good, by the way, if, if you catch them on the weekends, man, some good football being played there. No, that the, the North Dakota, uh, state Montana state game we, we, was a fantastic game. Um, uh, where, where, where the bison actually pulled the, uh, the small upset and advanced, yeah. uh, in the brackets. And now we're, now we're down to, down to eight and, as I mentioned, South Dakota State is a, a significant favorite to win, but uh, never count out the Bison. Montana has had a great season as well. So yeah, those games will uh, those games will be fun. A couple of them are, are aligned pretty big because of the, the games involving the top seeds. I think are expected to be blowouts, but the other ones in there should be very, very entertaining games. 
Also, the games that are not in domes, the terrible weather games too, they're like fun to watch. There's always this bad weather in, in, in these outdoor environments in Montana and in, in the Dakotas. Um, all right, let's uh, let's recap where your wagers are now before we get to our best bets. Bears made two wagers in bowl games so far. He has West Virginia minus the three in the Dukes Mayonnaise Bowl. Um, we got we got to root for that one. So Bear can pour some mayonnaise on him. And the Bad Boy Mowers Pinstripe Bowl. He has Rutgers plus two and a half. All right, Bear. Best bet early on for the bowl game that you like the best. What do you got? Yeah, I grabbed Ole Miss plus four and a half earlier in the week. Four and a half is now gone, unfortunately. But as we alluded to, I will take Ole Miss on the money line. I will take Ole Miss plus three and a half uh, here as well. As I said, I think we're going to get a ton of opt outs from from Penn State. Chop Robinson's already gone, like Sammy had mentioned. Uh, I think you're going to you're going to lose, lose the offensive tackle. He's probably going to be the, the top offensive lineman taken in the draft. Um, you're going to, I think, Manny Diaz, like I mentioned, maybe he's going to be at Duke and maybe he won't be uh, on the sidelines calling calling the defenses in this game. Whereas I think after what what happened with, with Ole Miss last year, uh, losing 42-25 to Texas Tech, I haven't heard of any potential opt-outs or, or departures uh, from Ole Miss. Uh, the, the Penn State offense has not played well all year against anybody really worthwhile. Uh, I think this is going to be one of those numbers that once the, the train kind of gets going and leaves the station on, okay, chops out, blah, blah, blahs out, blah, blah. Manny maybe gets the Duke job. Uh, I think that this is a, uh, this number is going to close well south of three and, and maybe even maybe even go off with Ole Miss or a, a slight favorite in this game if everything that happened for Penn State that I think could happen would. So I uh, I grabbed Ole Miss plus four and a half. I'd still take them plus three and a half, and I'll take them on the money line as well. I like it. Guys, the motivation, again, just listen to us talk about these games. The motivation matters a lot. And my best bet, Bear, I'm laying a big number with Notre Dame because of motivation and coach. Like, everything we talked about – as a reason to fade a team in the bowl season is the Oregon State Beavers. They're, they're playing the Sun Bowl against Notre Dame. It's minus eight and a half right now. Let's talk about Oregon State very quickly. Their coach left to Michigan State. He took with him the offensive coordinator and the offensive line coach. And uh, maybe the quarterback coach too. I, I don't know all the coaches, but again, you have an Oregon State team who is going to play Notre Dame without half of their offensive coaching staff, right? And so who coaches for them? Graduate assistants and and uh and, and analysts. On top of that, there are two quarterbacks in the transfer portal. There are two young corners in the transfer portal. Their best middle linebacker in the transfer portal. Their second team all conference tight end in the transfer portal, Bear. <laughs> no, no one's playing this game for them. And they have a half coaching staff. On the flip side, look, reports out of Notre Dame. Sam Hartman's going to play. Now, their they're right left tackle might not play. Their right tackle might not play. Their running back might not play. But in general, Bear, they have more talent than Oregon State in this game. Like, I don't know what Oregon State's motivation is with half their roster gone and their coaching staff gone. I know Trent Bray got the job. I get that. But I, I he's not even coached. Look, the head coach, it, this is part about all this, Bear. Like, they promoted from within. And I still think they have an interim coach coaching the game, the bowl game. Like, it's a weird situation with a new coaching staff and whatnot. So, I'll take the Irish here. I'll lay the number eight and a half and be happy with it. Yeah, I think the fact that this number has gone down, I think it was 10 and now it's down to eight and a half. Obviously, people assuming uh, Hartman and all those guys not going to play. Uh, I kind of like where you're headed with this, though, that at a cheaper number, Notre Dame might be the play because you look at everything that happened with with Oregon State this year and a uh, good start and, and then come close and you nearly beat Washington. You'll, you'll lose the Civil War. Now you're without a conference. And yeah, maybe the, you, you, you're re energized being that you know you're going to play Oregon next year, which is great. They're going to find a way to continue that robbery. But yeah, I, I, I don't know how much can be left in the tank for, for Oregon State here, especially without all the talent as well as the coaching staff uh, on this field. So I, 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 I like the way you're headed and I wonder – if once you wonder if you might want to wait a little bit, maybe buy some eight and a half now, but you might want to lay a little, wait a little bit in case those Notre Dame opt outs become official. This number could come down a little bit more, and yeah. you might want to get a better number uh, on the Irish here. It's possible, but then when people look at Ben Gorbranton starting the game, I think people might rush to bet the, the Irish. Like, I just, <laughs> Ben Branson's going to start. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's the thing about, like, you could say that Oregon State's motivated because they want to have a new coach, but their guys are not playing. Their best players are 
all not playing this game. And so, uh, and that, that, that doesn't count by the way, an offensive lineman or two that might opt out the right tackle projected first round draft pick their left guard. I mean, the left tackle projected, you know, second day draft pick their center is, uh, and they're again, their offensive line coach is gone too. So uh, I, I like the Irish here, but your point's well taken. This number could, could drop below seven at some point if Sam Hartman is declared out. All right, bear. I think we did it, buddy. We made it through a, a, a bull ish preview show. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it was good. We, we, I think we we got a, a few more plays than I actually anticipated uh, getting out at this point. So I, hopefully we can get ahead of some numbers. Hopefully we're on we're on we're on some good sides with how we're approaching things. Uh, sorry, uh, we don't really have any uh, Army Navy uh, thoughts for you, but honestly, what 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 good does it do to say, oh yeah, take the dog and take the under? Like like yeah, that's like treetop stuff. But and unfortunately, I got got nothing for you there. But we will have more for you on Friday when the NFL pod drops. That's another edition of Big Noon Kickoff presents Bear Bets in the book here. Uh, for Jeff, for Sammy P, for Will, uh, I'm the Bear. Make sure you uh, continue to rate, review, subscribe, download, watch, listen, uh, anywhere you sub- you uh, take in your podcast and uh, that YouTube channel as well. It's always fun to see our uh, animated selves uh, on the air. Remember, that's the bet. Well, you lose when you win. <laughs>